Hello, everybody. We are so excited to have Trevor McGregor on the Tech Guys Who Invest podcast. Trevor, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me on. All right, Trevor. Well, we're going to dive right in and really lean into your expertise. And we wanted to ask you, what is the importance of mindset as it relates to someone's uh, success? Well, thank you for that question. And again, it's everything because again, most people, Kevin and Adam, think it's just a strategy. If I've got the right strategy, I'm able to follow these steps and go out there and do you know, what it is I want to do. Well, that's only partially true because we believe that mindset really prepares you you know, in your belief system, in your identity, and in so many things that if you really get that aligned first and then go out there and execute on the strategy, you can absolutely do it in a much better fashion. Yeah, interesting. So um, what do you think is something that the highest performing people do that, that others don't? As someone like yourself who coaches uh, the, the highest performing people, peak performance, if you will, it, it'd be really interesting for our listeners to hear like some kind of insights you have about what those folks do that just your, your average regular people don't do. Oh, what a great question that is. And there's really three things. And the very first one is what we call in, in high performance, whether I'm working with, you know, a Fortune 500 executive, an Olympian, you know, gold medal Olympian, um, whether I'm working with a professional sports hero, a doctor, a lawyer, a real estate investor, um, anyone that really wants to play at something at the highest level starts with number one, and that is total immersion, right? They go full on into something to understand it, to learn it, to, to really, you know, almost, you know, marry it in a sense, because if you want to be at the top of your game, doesn't matter if you're in business or sports or technology or whatever, um, you know, it's, it's total immersion. I mean, how did we learn language? Well, when we were toddlers, we listened to our mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, and we were immersed in it. And that really became the focal point for us to really start to speak. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah. And once you immerse your something, yourself in something that takes us to number two and number two is really what we call repetition, right? Repetition is where you do it over and over and over and over and over. You know, even if you're really good at it, you think about somebody like, I don't know, a Bruce Lee. I mean, he said that really mastery is achieved when you've, you know, done 10,000 kicks perfectly or 10,000 punches perfectly the same time. You know, for me, um, I like to think that I've achieved at least some sort of mastery in coaching because at this stage of my career, I've done over 25,000 coaching sessions. And yes, that's an actual statistic. So as I went into immersion, right, and I had repetition, that really set me up for what we'll call number three. But before we go there, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I recently read, Trevor, that it's not it's not just the repetition. If someone were to just be sort of going through the motions, if you will, uh, that it wouldn't stick as much as if they were just going all in, which I think leads to the immersion point a bit, but if they were just going all in really trying every single rep, does that, uh, is there anything to that? Well, again, different strokes for different folks. Some people have a little bit of a different, um, you know, uh, emotional mastery, physical mastery. Um, some people, you know, learn quicker. Some are, you know, um, visual, some are auditory, some are kinesthetic. So what's really been fascinating, and this has kind of been my laboratory for the last decade is I think different people have different uh, learning styles and different immersion styles and different rep repetition styles that literally can achieve a certain level of success, but depending upon, you know, how they enter in and what their skill sets are. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. So what's number three? Well, number three is really, you know, once you do the total immersion and, and once you do that repetition, the third one is literally where you literally become that high performer who marries their identity of who they are and what they do at the highest level. So when you think of a guy like Michael Jordan, when you think of a guy like Kobe Bryant or, you know, um, maybe LeBron James, when you think of a guy like Wayne Gretzky, or Tom Brady, right? They literally have this, you know, belief. And, you know, Tony Robbins, who was somebody that I had the pleasure of working with and for for over half a decade, he has this saying that the strongest force in the human personality is the need to remain consistent with our identity. 
So if Michael Jordan's got an identity or Tiger Woods or Wayne Gretzky or Sidney Crosby or Tom Brady, that they're one of the best in the world, they're going to get up early, stay up late, condition, work with the coaches, do whatever they need to do to stay in that identity. So when you bring all three of those together, you've got the immersion, right? You've got the repetition, and then you've got somebody who believes, you know, in the mindset that they are very, very good at what they do. That's what I call the trifecta for high performance. Does that make sense? 100% yeah. makes sense. So there's that belief in yourself, that confidence, the people you talk about, Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, they believe that when they stepped onto the court or to the rink, they were the best and the results proved it. Now, how do you distinguish between, let's say, uh, motivation and, or versus being disciplined? And the reason I ask is I've read things that say that motivation is kind of like it's a fleeting type of fuel to use. Yes. Whereas if you have discipline, it's, it's much better. So I'd love to get your thought on that. Yeah, I love that question too. Motivation to me is where you get inspired in the moment. Maybe you read a really good book. Maybe you listen to a great podcast like this. Maybe you are at an event and you literally go, oh my God, this is it. I finally defined what it is that I want to do or what I want to be or how much money I want to make or the job I want to have or whatever it is. And you get motivated in that moment. But that doesn't create what we call lasting change. That's temporary change where you get fired up. And then it's just like a New Year's resolution. I mean, we know the statistics that by you know January 15th, 95% of all New Year's resolutions are out the window. Well, why is that? Well, because we're conditioned to get motivated on the 31st of December to set these goals for our career, our finances, our health, our you know relationships, our fulfillment. This is going to be the year. And then again, universally, 15 days later, it goes into the toilet. So that's really the first part of that is, is motivation is really can be a fleeting thing without really, really, really understanding, you know, what's on the other side of that. And that is discipline. That is where you get up early. Again, you stay up late, you condition your mind, your body for success. You work with coaches, teachers, mentors, trainers, facilitators in what we call lasting change, where it becomes a routine. It becomes a habit. It becomes a ritual that you just do over and over and over and over. And it just becomes part of your identity and you know what you do as much as who you are. Does that make sense? Absolutely makes yeah. sense. So when we're talking about the identity, one thing that I, I think maybe this is I've struggled with this in the past is how do you know if it's your true identity or if it's an identity crafted through external forces, maybe conditioning or something other, maybe you, you, societal pressures, hypothetically speaking. Well, you guys really bring the great questions here because that's really <laughs> the million dollar question. If let's say we grow up and, and our parents have this wish for us to become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, right? That's an external expectation that is thrust upon millions and millions of you know, people getting out of high school every single year. But ultimately, you can't live your life for your parents. You can't ultimately expect to please everybody. So I think that people have to stop and do what we call taking inventory of you know, what is external? What is it that your parents or your peers or your friends or your, you know, your colleagues want for you versus what's in your heart? Because guys, if you really believe in, you know, the fact that we are all here on purpose and with purpose, none of us are the same. We all have different thoughts, beliefs, desires. And in the, actually, if you look up the Latin root of the word desire, and the desire lives on your heart, by the way, it means of the father of God, of spirit, of source, of infinite intelligence, as Napoleon Hill would say. And so really, if you are able to block out that external stuff, and you know, you can appreciate what other people want for you. I'm not saying to make it right or wrong, but I think you got to go internal. I think you got to ask, you know, what's on my heart in terms of what do I love? What excites me? What lights me up? How can I add more value? Because at the end of the day, you know, we often talk about, well, you know, how do you make money? Well, Money is simply a byproduct of adding value to other people. So the more value we add in the world, the more those avalanches of abundance can find us, especially if it's a passion project or something we love to do, be, or have. Does that help make you understand that? Yeah, that does. Thank you for, for breaking that down. Yeah, you bet. that's awesome. Love that. Uh, so Trevor, I think even the 
best performers or even the best of us get stuck sometimes. I mean, like I know I do, you know, what, what can someone who's stuck do to kind of break out of that and, and get themselves moving again and start performing at a high level again? It's a great question. And I guess, you know, for the average person, when most people hit an obstacle or a roadblock, right, it literally stops them in their tracks. Whenever I or another, you know, high performer, peak performer hits the wall, you know, the first thing you got to do is get curious and you got to start asking yourself better questions. And that might be, you know, what is it that I'm feeling in the moment or what is it that I'm seeing or what is it that I'm hearing or what is it that I'm feeling? Because I'm telling you, um, you know, success leaves clues, but so does failure. So at the end of the day, if you look at anybody that's been successful, quote unquote successful, whether it's Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Oprah Winfrey, Tony Robbins, take your pick. Not everyone has literally gone in a straight line from where they were to where they wanted to be. You know what? They've oftentimes do this and that and hit the wall and, you know, fall down. But it's, it's really identifying that, you know, um, God's delays are not God's denials, which sometimes means that sometimes the universe puts up a wall or slams a door in our face to see what we're going to do to build the muscle, you know, to get back up, dust ourselves off and keep moving forward. So at the end of the day, um, you know, there's a great quote by Napoleon Hill and Adam, I think you probably know this one. And he says that every adversity brings with it the seed of equivalent advantage. And I want to say that again, every adversity brings with it the seed of equivalent advantage. What does that mean? Well, it really means that every dark cloud has a silver lining. If you look at any cloud in the sky, I guarantee the sun is shining behind it. And oftentimes there's a gift and we got to be reminded. And the best way to cultivate that is again, curiosity, better questions. And I'm telling you, if you're going to be grateful for your successes, you better be grateful for your challenges. Because again, it's the universe's way of getting us all to build muscle. Oh, I love it. Th this, is, this is so good. And I think it is what people might lose sight of if they find themselves either getting stuck or even sliding into a bit of a funk or, or something like that. And to hear what you're talking about can really help them snap out of it. And it, it's interesting, Trevor, I hear a lot of being aware, you know, like self-awareness and um, uh, sort of also perspective and having the, you know, having that perspective and being able to look at the, uh, think outside of what you feel like you're going through to see that, Hey, there's another side of this. That's right. You know, it's funny you bring that up because again, there's just something that I say to everybody that I start coaching. And that is this, that every problem is a problem of perspective. I'll say that again, every problem is a problem of perspective. And we tend to see through one lens only, right? When if we get on the other side of it, maybe we see something totally different. It's kind of like when, you know, the police go to investigate an accident that happened in an intersection, they'll go interview people, you know, that are on this side of the street and they'll write down and document everything that happened when these cars collided. Then they go over kitty corner, you know, to the opposite side of the street and they interview those witnesses, oftentimes they get a completely different account of what happened when the cars hit each other. So who's right, who's wrong? Well, it really doesn't matter because perspective is something that we each have and we formulate based on our beliefs, based on our values, based on our rules, based on our upbringing, our teachings, you know, for some people, religion and some people where they live on the planet. So at the end of the day, nothing has meaning until you give it a meaning but you're spot on that sometimes we got to really resolve by looking through a different set of lenses to see what else we can see. Man, I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving recording this. This is fantastic. Welcome to my world. This is what I get to do all day, every day with people all over this beautiful blue planet. One thing that I've learned recently is to surrender to the resistance. And what I mean by the resistance is uh, there are days where I don't feel like, well, the motivation's gone. But then, and I get frustrated. Like, I don't want to analyze this real estate deal. I don't want to, but I remember that I've made the choice. So I need to surrender to the adversity, surrender to the challenges, you will, because I'm, you know, making that conscious effort to do something different and kind of, uh, what I'm learning is that 
if I fight it head on, I kind of ex, uh, exert twice as much energy with minimal progress. However, if I accept, all right, this is the challenge. Even if I just get a little bit done today, that should be enough. Uh, that's one thing that I'm, I'm learning. And I've, I've read that too. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that kind of idea of surrendering to uh, the resistance. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Because I think most people think that the word surrender means to give up. It doesn't. It means to let go of. And sometimes, I mean, think of yourselves, you know, holding a baseball bat and you want to hit that ball so far. You want to hit a home run and you've got a death grip on that bat. Well, there's no way in heck those, those wrists are going to be able to hinge to bring the bat around to hit a home run because you're squeezing too tight. You have to surrender and let go a little bit and lessen up on the grip. And then you can knock that ball right out of the park. And I think it's the same thing because we've literally been judged that when we've, you know, surrendered or maybe stopped going at it, you know, make your move, go through the wall. You can do this rah, rah, rah. You know, that is pure matter trying to change matter. Right. And sometimes matter will change matter. Sometimes force will make it happen. But oftentimes when we surrender or let go, you know, we get a breather, we get a different perspective, we get re-energized, we get, you know, an opportunity to go, what do I really, 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 really want? And then you have to recommit because I'm telling you, there's only two things that I see in people all over the planet. And that is some people are interested in achieving their goals, while other people are committed to achieving their goals. And the difference is this, that people that are interested will do, you know, what's convenient Whereas the people that are committed, they'll do whatever it takes and whatever it takes might be, you know, starting and stopping. It might be, you know, reading books, listening to podcasts, finding a coach or a mentor. But ultimately, I think for the people that are defiantly committed to what they want, they don't give up. They realize that just letting go for a little while gives them a, a chance to reset. And even if they face, you know, a big challenge or they hit a big wall, I truly have a belief that a setback is a setup for a comeback. I'll say it again. A setback is oftentimes a set up for a comeback. And it certainly happened in my life and in the lives of thousands and thousands of people that I coach. So does that make sense? Very much so. Love it. And on, on the same token of, of surrendering, how do you know when it's okay to give up something versus I am, what I mean by this is how do you kind of coach somebody to say, Hey, maybe you should take a step back from this versus them feeling like they've quit something. Well, if, that I think make, I, if that makes sense. It, it always makes sense because I think that some people think that, you know, there's only one way to go after something, right? This is how it's going to be done. And they start going down that road and they realize, wow, this maybe isn't as easy as I thought it was, or it's going to take a little bit more time. So I think that stepping back, and literally remembering not to suffer in the fact that you didn't get it the way you wanted it. Because, you know, my coach, my mentor, Tony Robbins has a great quote, and he says that suffering is optional, right? And for those people that suffer, right? And they feel like a failure or they feel like they didn't get to their outcome or they feel less than, right? That puts them in a bit of a, a downward spiral or even a depression. Whereas other people really listen, you know, to their heart. So my invitation always to my clients is let's get out of your head and get into your heart, right? Because if you stay in your head, you're dead. But if you get out of your head and you get into your heart, you start to feel the feelings of what's possible. You start to feel the emotional residue to what it would be like, again, to get up, dust yourself off and keep going. Or it's also sometimes a sign from the universe that it's time to pivot and go down a different path, right? So ultimately, at the end of the day, again, different strokes for different folks. But Man, I'm telling you, I always, always follow my gut more today and my heart, whereas in my 20s and 30s, I was stuck in my head. And I'm telling you, if you could get out of your head and into your heart and your gut, I'm telling you, that's where the truth lives and that's where your whole essence lives. That's so awesome. And, you know, in a way, I think we're taught, and at least in, in our society and in, in America, at least, to... Um, to get into your head. Like it's almost, it feels like we're sort of taught out of that. Cause when I was a kid, I definitely would follow my gut, follow my heart. And then it was sort of drummed out of me. And now I don't. And, and then it's almost difficult to try to reintroduce it. But once you do it, it feels so good. 
Oh, I love that, bro. I mean, you're singing from my song sheet, you guys. Because <laughs> I'll tell you, when you were three years old or four years old, you thought you could be anything. You thought you could be anybody. You could be an astronaut or a firefighter or a policeman or a nurse or a school teacher or whatever. And you had hopes and dreams and you would play games all day long. And then what happens is you went to grade one and grade two and grade three, and you were told to sit down, be quiet, get in line, raise your hand to go to the bathroom. And I believe that it really stifles what I call creativity, where you don't think you're good enough. You don't think you're smart enough. You don't think that you could be, do, or have what you thought you could at the age of three or four or five or six. So I think as parents and as you know, members of society, we got to be very careful not to um, kill the creative juice of our youth today, but in, instead inspire them, engage them and enroll them in conversations and in literally, you know, understanding that they could, you know, absolutely create it the way they want. And, um, you know, that's something that I, I promote, my wife promotes, and a lot of the clients that we promote, we really ask, you know, what is possible? Because a lot of people say, well, you know, the sky's the limit. Well, I say, well, let's rip the label off of that because there is no limit. The sky goes forever. So no matter who you are, what your experience has been, what your education is, if you can return to your creativity, you know, the gift that you were given, you know, from something that, you know, has given you life. I'm telling you, you tap into that creativity and you follow that heart and that gut of yours, you can refine it and unleash it like you've never thought possible. We're, we're just, I'm just stunned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's awesome. Thank <laughs> but you. guys, come on. How can you argue that? Right. No, it's great. Think about it. Something gave you life. Something allows your heart to beat almost right. 100,000 times a day without you even thinking about it. Something allows your lungs to take in oxygen without you even thinking about it. You're growing new stomach lining. You're growing new cells on your eyeballs. You're growing hair and fingernails. I think whoever designed it this way did a pretty damn good job. So ultimately it's not for, you know, the government or society to turn us all into factory workers and literally live a mundane life. That old model is broken. And I think people are waking back up to the fact that, you know what, we're all entrepreneurs at heart. We can all be, do, or have anything we want, whether we're in real estate or IT or education or anything. I'm telling you, um, I just absolutely love sharing this message because Sometimes people need to hear it again for the first time because they haven't heard it since kindergarten or, you know, sometime before that. What do you guys think? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the, a, a lot of people probably haven't heard it um, since then. Right. Like, I, I mean, it's not like they got little bits of it along the way. It's sort of almost forgotten in a lot of ways. And then when people get a, a high performance, top of their field coach like yourself they get they get reminded of it uh, unfortunately access to guys like you isn't you know i mean it's it's tougher right it's not out there for everyone so it would be really awesome to you know not to go off on on a tangent but you know to improve the education system so that it isn't lost that way so just I agree. Thoughts. And I think that it's through conversations like this and, you know, the listeners hearing this, that they'll go share this conversation with their mm -hmm. spouse or their significant other or their business partner or, you know, their colleagues or whatever. Because again, uh, there's a great quote by Margaret Mead that says, you know, never underestimate what a small group of people can do to change the world. Because in the end, it's the only thing that ever has, right? Mm. We're a small group of three right now, but through the listenership and through them sharing it, through great books, through great, you know, podcasts, events, personal growth. Um, I believe that the world is absolutely sitting with an insatiable appetite, ready to eat this stuff up because it's needed at a time that there's never been a better time to get this message back out there. Awesome. Now, one thing that I've experienced trying to achieve success is inevitably I'll end up comparing myself to others uh, even at the subconscious level, while I'm scrolling through social media, for example, I'm like, oh man, I, I hear it in my brain. Why don't I have that? Or why aren't I doing that? Whatever the case may be with the high level individuals, uh, I'd imagine that they, there's that level of comparison, but maybe in a different lens. Cause they're ultra competitive, but I feel that 
foundationally being competitive, there's a comparison aspect to that. So how do you kind of coach somebody past that uh, need to compare? Oh my gosh. Well, I've got three things I could speak to about that because boy, it's rampant right now. Right. And I think the very first thing is, is a great quote that I've always remembered. And it's really that comparison is the thief of joy, right? Comparison is the thief of joy. If all we're doing is comparing ourselves, comparing our houses, our cars, our, our, you know, salaries, you know, there's always going to be somebody else that makes more money or lives in a bigger house. Right. So it's kind of, you know, futile to really live in existence where all we do is compare because again, comparison is the thief of joy. The second thing I'll say is my coach, my mentor, Tony Robbins once said the comparison is like drinking too much red wine and having a hangover. He calls it the comparison hangover. It doesn't feel good, right? So we don't want to have those comparison hangovers because I'm telling you, people are scrolling through Facebook right now looking at the fictitious lives of their friends because what people post isn't really what's happening. It's the glorified version of the stuff that they want to promote on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. So I think people have to, you know, literally review that stuff with a grain of salt and not always think, oh my God, she's got it so much better than me or he's got it so much better than me because everybody's got, you know, skeletons in the closet. That's number two. When you talk about high performers in comparison, they don't compare with each other, what they do is they get inspired from each other. When you think about a, a LeBron James and a Michael Jordan, right? Or a Sidney Crosby and a Wayne Gretzky or a Tiger Woods and a Rory McIlroy, right? They're at the top level of what they do. But the last thing they're gonna do is feel like they're not good enough or they're not better because ultimately what they're doing is trying to up-level each other and engage and roll and inspire each other to be at their best. And I think a a great example of that for us, because I'm not, you know, Michael Jordan, and you guys don't look like Wayne Gretzky. But at the end of the day, um, I'll give you a personal story. I, when I was a kid, I used to, you know, want to have a really, really nice car. And I'd see people drive by in a Mercedes or drive by in a Jaguar. And I thought, man, they're, they're probably lucky. They probably got born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And they always had money. And now they've got these great cars. Well, little did I know that that form of jealousy or comparison was literally hindering me because it was coming from a negative place versus thinking, which is the way I think now, is that, wow, I bet that person worked really hard to be able to buy that Mercedes or buy that Jaguar. Or I bet that person listened to great podcasts, read books, added a ton of value, and money became the byproduct of that value. And now they can go out there and buy whatever car they want. So again, at the end of the day, you've got to really, really think about what's the meaning that we're giving things because guys, we are all meaning making machines. And as meaning making machines, we're making meanings out of everything all day long. In fact, we have anywhere between 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. Now get your head around that 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And some of them are conscious and some of them are subconscious, right? What am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What's the weather like? Are my kids going to be safe? What time's the game on? So think about that 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And the bad news is, is that science has discovered that roughly 75% of those thoughts are negative. So we're already behind the eight ball, knowing that the same thoughts we're having today are the same thoughts we had yesterday and the same thoughts we had the day before. Then guess what? The same thoughts we're having today the majority of them will be the same ones we're having tomorrow. So ultimately we got to stop the insanity and we've got to really stop making meanings that don't support us because most of the meanings that we give things come from our memory of the past. That is, we have more references to the past because we've been on the planet for 20, 30, 40, 50 years or more than we have references for the present or even the future. That's why we invite people to park the memories of the past just for a moment to step into the present to create a vision of the future. What do you want? Why do you want it? Who do you need to be to show up and go after it tooth and nail? Because the more we can lock on what we want, you know, the more the brain works like Google to go out there and find ways to get us what it is that we want. So that was a long ramble, but what did you guys get out of that? Oh, so, so much. Uh, and there, there's this idea that 
where, where your focus and your energy goes is so you will go right. And, and have it turning in talking to you every time, you know, we'll ask about something that maybe hanging people up an impediment to them, uh, helping them stick. You're offering the, these positive ways to look at it. That perspective is different. And it just makes sense that if you take those 75% of the negative thoughts and start to change a lot of those to the positive thoughts, you're all going to go there. And then you're just going to kind of find yourself succeeding and having these wins and being positive. Yeah. And it's not that everything's rosy all the time. This isn't unicorns and rainbows and lollipops, but what it is, is making a conscious decision to start thinking and behaving differently than maybe you have been for the past few years, certainly through the pandemic and, you know, this whole COVID thing, I know that a lot of people have really hit the bottom, right? They've been eating a lot of food, gaining a lot of weight, drinking a lot of alcohol, not being with their extended family members, not traveling. Well, that stuff's real. We're not going to deny it. But if that's their focus, what do you think their energy is like? What do you think their vibration is like? What do you think their frequency is like? Because I'm telling you, you can't do magnificent things from that level of thought or thinking or identity. You got to see things as they are, but not worse than they are. And you got to start to say things like, even though we're in the you know end of the pandemic, I truly believe that our better times are coming. Or even though that, you know, I haven't been able to go out there and change my career, I believe that we're coming to the end of this and there are going to be a lot of opportunities moving forward, right? It's like you're either a pessimist or you're an optimist. Your glass is either half empty or it's half full. Well, you guys can tell I'm pretty passionate about this. My cup is overflowing with avalanches of possibility because I'm telling you at the end of the day, we are each responsible to go out there and literally move forward with what it is we want to create. And that, again, is something that I think we're all going to have a bigger and better time doing as this pandemic winds down. What do you guys think? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so Trevor, I, I'm, my mind is blown hearing you talk. And I just, I'm a personal development junkie. I do all, I meditate, I journal, I exercise, all of those things. And it's not a magic bullet. It does help. Somebody that's listening to this, we now have discussed that motivation is going to be fleeting. So what would you say is, is maybe the three steps they can take to start growing themselves personally? There's four steps, Kev. There's four steps I'm going to give. We're going to give them a bonus step. But it really comes back to a conversation. And I've had this conversation with Adam before where there's four little words that start with the letter S as in success that I think the listeners need to really do a personal inventory of, right? And I'll go through all four of them one by one here because the first word is what we call their state management. For anyone that wants to get better, the very first thing you got to do is be aware of how you're showing up in your mind and in your body, right? If you're tired, if you're lethargic, if you're slumped over, you're not going to be in a very good mood. So you got to really do things that change your state. Get up, move, hydrate, put on really good music, but do something that engages the body. And that will allow you to shift your focus away from what you don't want to feel or what you don't want to something that you do want. That's the first S, your state management. The second one is your story. And your story is really your identity. Are you being a victim or are you choosing to be a victor on the way to victory? Because if you're living in your lower self, we call that your victim, you're not going to make the same decisions from your victim that you would if you were a victor. And the way you get into a victor state is to really condition your state, right? So we, that's why we always start with state. So we go state and story. Once we do that, we move to the third S and the third S is your strategy. And the very simple three-step process for anybody doing anything should be you know, what is the result that I want? Why do I want it? And who do I need to be to go take intelligent and inspired action now to move towards it? So again, what do I want? Why do I want it? What can I do in the moment to start moving towards it? Because as Tony says, never leave the site of a goal without taking intelligent and inspired action immediately towards it. So once we've conditioned our state and our story, and we're executing on a strategy the fourth and final S is the most important one. And that is your standards. 
What are your standards? What are your levels of commitment to play at? What is it right now that you need to draw a line in the sand and step over that line, never returning to your lower self again? Is it in finances? Is it in your health? Is it in, you know, listening to a podcast every day? Is it in being nicer to your kids, your aging parents? There's something that we can all do. And as Tony says, the quality of your life will be in direct proportion to the level that you are able to raise your standards and stay there. So again, I invite the listener to check in with those four S's every day. What is your state? What is your story? What is your strategy? And what standards are you holding yourself to? So how does that sound? That's awesome. I took notes very vigorously. I, 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 <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And you I'm going to add a fifth I, S. This is be me being selfish and asking these questions too. <laughs> well, that's good. And again, I don't profess to know it all, but again, I'd have to be an idiot at this stage not to see what has helped my clients achieve phenomenal success right? and what has held people back and, you know, kept them playing small. Because at the end of the day, guys, um, there's only two forces that I really believe in. One is contraction, but the other one that I really love is expansion. And the number one law of the universe is the law of expansion. It's life bringing to us more life, life bringing more love, life bringing more abundance, life bringing more travel, right? More opportunity, more friendships. Anything beyond that is contraction, right? And contraction's okay for people that want to play small, but for anybody that is here on purpose and with purpose and wants to suck the juice out of this journey we're on for 80, 90, 100 years, this is the work that they need to do. Does that help you guys understand it? Yeah, and, and you can really see uh, after listening to you uh, how people who take this and apply it really do perform at those peak levels, right? I mean, it kind of makes sense now why some people perform at that level and others don't because they're taking this kind of thing and applying it. And you could, you could just imagine, you could see it, the difference it makes. So Trevor, I would love to know some things that you're reading right now or some things that you're interested in. Um, it would, I think it would just be really neat to hear uh, maybe maybe one or two either books or, or some pieces of content that you're interested in right now. Well, thank you. And again, um, my goodness, there are so many great books out there, um, but I always come back to some of the staples, right? And I absolutely am a big believer in rereading books like Think and Grow Rich. I mean, I've read it over 50 times. It's my Bible. I've got the audio book as well. And my kids can even recite passages from it because it's been so helpful to get me from where I was to where I am today. So books like Think and Grow Rich, um, you know, the, you know, Stephen Covey's, you know, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, oh, yeah. Tony Robbins, Personal Power. Um, those are classics. And I think for people that go, oh, that book is old. I want to read something new. I think they're really missing out on opportunity, right? Because those books have stood the test of time. And they're even as relatable today, given what we're going through together, as maybe they were when they were written. So those are the types of books I love to read. Um, there's great podcasts like this. There's, you know, personal growth events, there's real estate meetups. There's just so many things that we can do to be at cause rather than at the effect. Um, so for people that are listening, take a personal inventory, right? What have you been listening to or what have you not been listening to, right? And for goodness sakes, be very careful with, you know, what we call the electronic income reducer, right? That's the television because right now the average American is watching 36 and a half hours of TV a week. Wow. Now get your heads around that. 36 and a half hours of mind numbing television a week. Well, that's not going to help you improve your body, your finances, your relationships. And I'm okay with a Netflix movie once or twice a week, but come on, 36 hours of TV a week is really dumbing people down and putting them into a trance. So my invitation is to turn off the remote, pick up a book, listen to a podcast, go for a walk, play with your kids, go outside, walk around on the grass in your bare feet, or do something different than you've done in the past two, three, four, five, six, 12, 14 months during the pandemic. Because again, this is your opportunity to change it up. It's spring as we record this. And I'm telling you, most new things are always launched in the spring by the universe. Let's launch the listener spring. Love it. Wow. 
This was this has been phenomenal conversation, Trevor. And normally, the way we end our podcast is asking a technology question, technology related. But we're going to switch it up for you. Uh, and what we want to ask you is, what would be the number one growth lesson or habit that you wish you had known about early on in your career or in your life? Wow. Well, thank you for having me on. You guys are rock stars and you guys have teed up these questions so beautifully for me. I want to thank you. But, you know, I think when we go back to it, I wish somebody would have said to me earlier that, you know what, um, you know, we're all here on purpose and with purpose and that we're not just here floating around doing nothing. We're all here to really, you know, add more value to our family, to our community, to our, our cities, our tribes, our, our communities, whatever it is. And I think that that comes from, you know, two things. Number one, it comes from a sense of passion, right? You got to refine the passion that maybe you once had that you lost or you've forgotten about because where there's passion, there's purpose. And obviously my passion is coaching. It's speaking, it's mentoring, it's training, it's facilitating. And I could do this all day long. In fact, I do. So I think that you've got to really check in and really ask yourself, get clear on what you don't want to do because that makes clarity for what you may or do want to do. That's number one. And number two, go back to the fact that, you know what, I think we're missing the fact that a lot of us have lost our hunger, right? We get complacent. We say, well, I'm making this much money. That's good enough. Or I've got this roof over my head. That's good enough. And for some people that's okay. But for people that reignite the passion and the hunger, you know, that, that gets the body moving and the brain moving to go out there and ask new questions, meet new people, lift up different rocks, look under things, because I'm telling you, the quality of your life will be in direct proportion to the passion and the hunger that you reignite to go to the next level, right? Because I'm telling you, you can do things right now that are good, but why be good when you could be great? Or why be great when you could be outstanding? Or if you want to literally, you know, take a play from my playbook, why be outstanding when you can be extraordinary or extra ordinary? And if the listeners will go back and listen to everything we've talked about today, I think they'll rekindle that spirit, find that passion, that hunger, and absolutely take their life to new heights. That's awesome, Trevor. I, I suspect people will listen to this one more than once. I know I will. I don't normally listen to all of our podcast episodes, but I will probably listen to this one a few times at a minimum. And uh, it's been it's been fantastic having you on. We're, we're so glad to have you. Now, if people want to get in touch with you or, you know, find out more about you, maybe even find out if there, there's a way they can get coaching from you. Also, if you have any programs or anything like that you'd like to talk about, we'd love to hear from you right now what that would be. Well, thank you again. And yeah, the best way for people to find me is on my website. You can go to trevormcgregor.com. That's T-R-E-V-O-R mcgregor.com. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. Um, and again, yeah, for anybody that is not just interested, but committed to living life at a higher level, let's talk. Awesome. Thanks, Trevor. It's been great having you on. Thanks for having me. Have a great day, guys.